So um, hopefully everybody's got the notebook in front of them and has Seaborn either was installed or, or were able to install it. So obviously I'm going to talk about visualization today um, using Python, but a lot of what I'm going to focus on is just general data exploration and what we call exploratory data analysis. Um, and I mean, a little more about me. The data set is in that Git repo. Um, it's an old one, as you can probably tell. When you look at the auto, the prices of cars being a few thousand dollars on average or something like that, but it's from 1985. But that doesn't, that isn't that important. What we're really interested in here is how do we take you know, a reasonably complex data set that has a lot of different columns of different types and visually understand it and also tools that you can use to then present observations you might have from, from visual analysis to your colleagues and bosses and customers, whatever. So, so this whole idea of visualization, exploratory data analysis, in the history of analytics and statistics and what is relatively new. Um, John Tukey, um, who I was privileged to know as a graduate student at Princeton, um, published this book in 1977. And this was sort of the culmination of research he had done for you know, about almost 20 years before that. And the, and, before that, you know, statisticians and other types of analysts, there were no data scientists, obviously, in 1977. That's a fairly new term. Um, you know, would put a graph or two into something, into a report or into a paper, but it was mostly about tables and it was very theoretical. And Tukey stepped back and said, wait, there's a lot you can learn just by visually examining your data, really trying to understand the relationships in your data, and you know, using a combination of maybe simple summary statistics and, um, and graphical methods. And that was a big revelation, believe it or not. I mean, nowadays I think it's, it seems so obvious, but maybe it wasn't in 1977. Um, another influence on me at least, but also on the whole field was this work by Bill, by Bill Cleveland, who was then um, um, director of the Stats Math Group at ATT Bell Labs, someone else I had the privilege to work with when I was at a company called Statistical Sciences, where we commercialized Bell Labs S, which you know eventually became open source R. Um, and so Bill very systematically went about trying to find different, you know, t he basically tested a lot of different ideas about graphics and how you can subdivide and present data and how people perceive it. And he tested it a lot of times on, on not just an average person on the street, um, you know, sample, but on fellow scientists at Bell Labs. So, um, and it was amazing how many times they didn't understand the plots that other people were showing them, um, even though it was a very sophisticated audience. I, I don't do a lot with this here, but I just want you guys to be aware of, obviously, Edward Tufte, um, and Yale professor still um, for a long time. This was his original sort of seminal book in the early 90s also. Um, and again, he, he looked at a, a different aspect of this than where Cleveland and Tukey came from. Um, and he was more interested in the clarity of the presentation. Um, and so he has, if you look at that book, you'll see there's some interesting rules about, um, you know, what's the ratio of actual information to the amount of ink you're, well, in those days, ink, because it was all on, you know, mechanical plotters in those days, but screen pixels <laughs> um, nowadays, I guess. So, um, so our goals are, are just what I've outlined here, to explore complex data using visualization, um, look at different chart types you can use because when you're exploring complex data, there's not just one chart type 
you know, you don't just keep doing the same thing over. Try a lot of different things. Expect to fail a lot um, and keep trying different things. And then we hit this problem immediately, which is a lot of what Cleveland um, especially was working on, is no matter how you represent computer-generated graphics, it's on a 2D surface, regardless of whether it's printed on paper or nowadays we project it onto a computer screen, it's basically flat, right? <laughs> it's 2D. And, um, you know, maybe you could do something fancy with VR headsets or something and get a third dimension. But complex data has many more dimensions than that. And so a couple of ways around that we'll use what we'll call plot aesthetics, which I'll, I'll get on to. Um, and, and also a method um, which has been reinvented by many people, and I'll talk about that, um, conditioning or faceting, where you, you basically do different group buys of the data. Um, it's like a group buy operation. So um, there's some resources here I, I put in the notebook. You know, in two hours, we're just gonna like scratch the surface, if even. <laughs> so just on how to do stuff, there's a lot of useful information. Like matplotlib, which is, as I'll show you, is, is kind of the, the base package for um, almost all Python graphics. There are, there are a few exceptions, um, like Bokeh, which we don't have time to go into, that do other types of, you know, plotting um, base packages. But if you go to this website that I gave you, on, it's matplotlib.org slash resources slash hindex. Um, there's just a lot of stuff from tutorials and videos and it's, it's, it's a pr books and, and what. And this is pretty highly curated. This isn't just like some random list. This is pretty high quality material. Um, some of you may have been with us um, in the last session in this room for um, the pandas tutorial. And there's pandas.pydata.org slash pandas slash docs. Anyway, you can see it. Um, there, there's this tutorial on visualization, which goes through a lot of the basics of how to, if you have your data in a pandas data frame, um, just a lot of stuff you can do with very few lines of code. I'd say that's the main advantage of this. You can get sometimes a long ways with not doing a lot of code. And then a relatively new package that we're gonna take advantage of here is Seaborn, and which is the one I wanted to make sure everybody had installed. It, it has taken, the, the people who are doing Seaborn, and I, I think this is still a sort of an in-flight project. It, there's missing pieces and, and things that, when I work with it, I feel like, gee, it really, there should be something here. Or, so I hope they continue to do new releases of this. Um, they seem to be active, there seem to be some active contributions going on. Um, it, it takes a lot of more sophisticated plotting ideas, a lot of them from the R world, a lot of this stuff that, that was done um, earlier on tended to be in R, and so R plotting was generally a little bit ahead of Python um, world, and so they've tried, with, with this package, um, Seaborn, but also another package called ggplot, um, which tries to imitate the ggplot2 package that's revolutionized graphics in R. Um, but we're not gonna, you know, I can only do so much in two hours. So we're gonna just focus on Seaborn, which is enough. So we're gonna do three different kinds of plotting. But, but don't get discouraged because the base plotting is always matplotlib for all these. And, and it's for the ggplot um, package as well. So, by the way, if you have questions, um, please interrupt and raise your hand. Also, I think on the live feed, we have somebody monitoring the, the Twitter. Um, if you're online watching and you'd like to come up with a question, please do. And we got a microphone we can pass around for the questions. So, so the first thing is we gotta just load this data. And how many of you are somewhat, at least somewhat comfortable with pandas? I hope 
or have been in the pandas tutorial just now. Okay, so it's a majority by far. So, so I'm gonna load this data into pandas data frame. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on pandas because we just had a pandas tutorial that some of you may have been in. But, um, so the basics are, you know, P, you know, so I import pandas as pd. So pd.read to csv, the file name, um, and I've assigned file name. And then I'm gonna give the, um, there's certain columns that are, that have missing values. And so, and they happen to be in these columns, these, so that's a list of my column names. And so, and, and in this data set, they don't use an NA or a, miss, or a null or something like that. They use a text question mark <laughs> as the missing value. That's just how it was coded. So, so first I, can, I convert all those to a NumPy NAN, so basically a missing value. And then I drop, um, I drop them, you know, if they're, and I convert those also to numeric, because they show up because of the missing values being coded as a text or, or a string question mark, they show up as string columns, whereas they're really numeric. So we'll run that whole thing, and with any luck, it's gonna work. And you guys can run it on your local environments too. All right, so whenever you're exploring data, you should get some idea of what, like what's in the data, right? Don't, don't just start randomly doing stuff. So let's just look at the head of that data frame with the head method. So dot head is the head method. And I could say n equals something here, you know, like n equals 10 or something, but oops. But for obvious reasons, I'm not gonna do there. Um, I have no idea why that happened. So let me just run that, and you've got, and so what we see is just the first five rows. We've got some, some columns we're not gonna use. I, I think the original idea, this data set originally was put together having to do with um, insurance losses on different types of automobiles, but we're gonna focus on their price, because it's a little easier to understand. So. So you have the make, you know, who made it, what type of fuel does it use, aspiration. Aspiration means like how does the air get into the engine, like is it turbo or standard. Number of doors, body style, drive wheels. Um, you'll see what, how this works as we go, um, et cetera. And then some things about, some features about the engine, and finally the price of the car. All right, let me just fix that so I don't. Okay, and we can, if we just use the describe method, that'll give us, again, some summary statistics on those columns. And let's just look at a couple of these here, like length, okay? So we can see there's 195 cars in the, that, where we have a length value. Um, the mean length, I think these are in inches, is 174. The standard deviation isn't actually that much, considering, and, and the range is actually from minimum of 141 to a maximum of 208. So, so it gives us an idea that cars don't have, you know, they're not super short, they're not extremely long, they're in a fairly narrow range, and you can look at these quantiles, you know, the 25%, the 50%, which is the same as the median, which is pretty close to the mean. So that also tells us that distribution of lengths of cars is probably fairly symmetric, right? Whereas if we scroll over here to price, we'll see the mean price is $13,000, which, like I said, this is kind of an old data set. Um, and, and we've got um, the standard deviation is quite wide, actually, 8,000. So we've got a big range of price. In fact, prices go from $5,000 to $45,000. And, um, and the median is $10,000, whereas the mean 
is $13,000. So, so in terms of exploring this data, we know that price is highly skewed. So, so those are just some things, and there's other things you can look at here, but those are just some things we'll keep in mind as we think about what charts, what visualizations are useful to, um, to digging into this data set. So, so let's, so now I'd like to just go through some basic plot types and, and introduce you to how we make those plots, which is, you know, one of our objectives here so that you come away with a working knowledge of Python plotting and how you use it to explore data and also how you can use it to create presentation graphics. So a really basic plot that everybody works with, of course, is a scatter plot. And um, well, let's just do the first one in matplotlib. And the recipe I'm showing you here is really simple. So if, obviously we have to import matplotlib.pyplot, because we're doing it from Python, right? And we're gonna use the plot method, and we can just say what values of x and y we want. And I want dot, red dots, okay? So to, to worry for each data point, okay? So the type has to be R for red and an O, small O for an O or a dot, <laughs> okay? And notice there's one thing, since we're working in, a, in Jupyter Notebook and it runs an IPython interpreter, um, if you don't include this magic command, matplotlib, in line with the percent in front, it will not plot your graph in line. I mean, you would normally think that would be what should happen, right? You run a plot command, you'd wanna see the plot in the IPython, you know, whether you're running in an IPython shell or in a, in a Jupyter notebook that runs IPython, but that's not the default, you have to say. So, so you can see, what, so just to show you in code, plot, you know, so I've imported matplotlib.pyplot as plot, PLT. So I've got PLT.plot, and then I've got X, Y, and type. So it's pretty simple, right? So go ahead and run that. And we got a plot. But, and so we have price on the vertical axis, presumably, and city miles per gallon, so some measure of fuel efficiency of those cars on the horizontal axis. Um, can, can people see there's a couple of obvious deficiencies of just taking this kind of default matplotlib plot? Can, what, what are a couple of them that you guys see? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Unlabeled. Yeah, unlabeled axes, that's a big annoyance, yeah. Anything else you guys see? Yeah? Yeah, there's overplotting. That's a good one. We'll, we'll get to working on that. But there's another one. Anybody else see it? Yeah, yeah, the x-axis is chopping. <laughs> Actually, the y-axis is, is just scaled to the max and min, so the dots are chopped down here on the bottom. Um, and, and that's just because we took the defaults. We didn't try to do anything fancy. Um, by the way, this business of not labeling axes is, is, is a huge, when I, I you know, I, I think it was mentioned in my introduction, I teach data science classes for both UW and for Harvard. And it's a huge pet peeve of mine because you get something like this and you don't know whether, you know, it's, average shoe size versus cows born or what, you know, what, what's this plot? You have no idea, right? Um, it could be anything, and, and so keep that in mind. So let's do a little better. So I have this in a pandas data frame, as you saw, right? That's how we loaded it. And so I can take that data frame, auto.prices, and apply the pandas plot method and I'll say the kind is a scatter plot. So kind equals scatter in quotes. And then I just say X, what my X and Y are, just like I did before. And go ahead and run that. And you see you get a somewhat new and improved plot, right? 
It's got axes, labels, the, these circles aren't chopped off. You still can't tell how many points are overplotting here very well. We'll get to that. But, but at least for one line of code, we've got a, sort of more miles for, or, or better, better output for just the one line of code using the, the pandas um, plot method. That's because pandas plot method is built as an, you know, it's an abstraction layer over the matplotlib. And you get more. So I want you guys to go ahead and try this yourself. Um, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do this. So um, do auto price versus curb weight. And there's um, somewhere up here. If you look at the column names, there's one called curb weight, which is, see, which is, as you can imagine, it's sort of the, the weight of the car when it's empty, okay? So just give that a try. Oh, and to execute the code in a, if you don't know, in a Jupyter Notebook cell, just hit shift enter with the, with the cursor anywhere in that cell, and it'll execute the code. Actually, how many of you have never used a Jupyter Notebook before? Only like two, okay. So hopefully it's not too overwhelming. Oh, there's a question way in the back. Could you run the microphone back there? I don't think. Plotting as oh, oh, he can. Yeah, I can. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Huh? It's on. Hello. Yeah. Yes. So for y-axis, uh, um, your y-axis starts with zero. For me, it's starting at five thousand. Hmm. That could just be different versions of pandas plotting. Um, I'm not, as you can see, you can force x limits and y limits as attributes, which we'll look at a little bit about attributes. Um, right now I'm not controlling them, so it's probably just a different version. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Was there another question way in the back too? Nope. All right. Okay, well hopefully you guys got something that looks about like this. It may not be, as we just discussed, exactly this, but okay. So let's get a little more sophisticated here. This is a really simple recipe, right? I mean, we're just using one line of code. We can specify an X, a Y, a kind, and you know, we'll get some, you can get some mileage out of that, so to speak. Um, but Let's use some of the matplotlib capabilities. Um, so, um, so I'm going to define a figure, which I'm going to call fig, and it's plot.figure. And I can, I, you can, if you look at the doc for this, there's all sorts of attributes about grid lines and all sorts of stuff. Right now, I'm just going to say fig size equals six by six. So it's going to be. Six, at least the way I've got my notebook set up, it'll be six by six inches. Um, and then, now that I've defined that figure, I can say, get, uh, let's set up, I'm just gonna do one axis on it. So, GCA is a method that defines an axis. And so now, I've got, you know, auto underbar prices dot plot. So this is all the same as you just saw before, except now I say, what's the axis? So I say AX equals AX here, right? So now, I'm, now I've said, okay, don't just use any default axis, use the axis I'm telling you to use. 
And, okay, so now that I've defined what axis it is, I can set all sorts of attributes, including, as we just talked about, x lim limits and y limits and on plotting, but I'm just gonna say ax dot set title, so I give it a title, set x label, so I give it an x-axis label, I give it a y-axis label, and you see, it doesn't look a whole lot different than the plot I had before, but I do have my title here. I do have sort of more human readable axis labels. So is that clear how I did that to everybody? Because that's kind of an important, it's simple, but it's also important <laughs> if you, to, to what we're gonna do. Um, uh, I, can you go back up to the code? Sure. Oh, so the question is, why are we setting all those attributes after the plot? I think the answer is it doesn't really matter. Um, I suppose you could set them before the plot. Um, it's just the, 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 because you're just setting up different attributes of how the plot's gonna be displayed, um, and you're saying use this axis to the pandas method. So, I don't know, you could, tr I don't know, let's try it. Let's see what, if we turn it around, I think it won't matter. No, it doesn't matter, I tried it. Yeah, okay, you tried it and it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter because it's just, it's just gonna run through all that. And you've only set one figure, so anything that applies to that axis, it'll just keep, you know, it's like a compound operation. It's gonna plot them in, I, I suppose, the order they're listed in the code, but the end result isn't gonna look any different. Okay. So here's another. Um, Hi, can you explain the difference between figure and axis? Like, can you switch the order of those in the code? The order of, I'm sorry, the order of which? Big equals plot dot figure and ax equals fig dot GCA. What's, what is the difference? Well, I had to, no, I have to define a figure first, which is just a plot area. The figure that I'm defining when I set that figure size is just a plot area. I, you'll see later we'll have multiple axes on a, on a figure. So yes, I have to create a figure before I can say that it ha gets one or more axes. What if you create another figure after that? Well, then you're starting another figure. It'll, everything I'm plotting here, if I define a new, if I run another figure method, I'll be working on a new figure. Was there another question behind there? Nope. Okay. Yeah, hopefully you'll see that because we'll we'll get to making multiple axes on a plot. I hope. <laughs> I hope. Hope I have time this. Okay. So a little exercise. Um, so take your plot that you did before which as you recall was the, um, the plot of the price versus curb weight and try to decorate it with a title and some axes labels and what, and also tr where you can control the figure size. You don't have to do six by six. I mean, you can do your own, if you wanna see four by four or eight by eight, whatever, whatever, you know. It doesn't even have to be rectangular to tell you the truth. I mean, you could do by.
Did everybody kind of get that then? And you can also cheat and see what I did. I changed mine up a little bit. I said, oh, well, I'm gonna make mine wider. So I made it eight by six. So if I've got a slightly different aspect ratio than, than the rect square we had before. For no good reason at this point, just doing it to do it. <laughs> okay, everybody with us? Oh, here's a question. The style? Oh, well, you mean the shapes and the colors? Those, those are aesthetics. We'll get to aesthetics. So, so the question was, how do you set the types of points? But we'll talk about aesthetics um, once we've gone through the basic plot types. So another plot type is a line plot. Oh. The units? Um, at least the way I have my notebook set up, it's, it's, it's inches, but it's inches based on some scale. It never quite comes out in real inches on my screen. So it's, it's a little, it's inches in somebody's scale, but it's a little hard to know. Usually if I'm trying to do something like for more pres good presentation quality, I'll wind up just messing around a little bit till I find a, um, you know, a set of a figure size that looks good. Well, I mean, scale in the sense like here I did eight by six. So obviously this axis is physically longer than the vertical axis. And, you know, pandas laid out the numbers correctly. You can do things to control the, I'm just taking the default tick marks and labels, but you can do, there's lots of stuff you can do to, if you want like more granular tick marks, you can also do things like rotate the, if you have a lot of tick marks that need labels, you can rotate the text so it isn't all chumped. Um, you know, if you keep getting into these, deeper things, you can do a lot of stuff. Of You can do just about anything you want, given enough code and pain, <laughs> um, is the answer. So, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna create a new data. So, so why do you use a line? So a scatter plot is good when you have a lot of data where each, you know, they're not ordered in any way, right? There's no order to these cars in terms of like price and weight or price and miles per gallon or anything like that. They're just, they're just whatever they are, right? It's just whatever order. I actually, I think they're ordered by manufacturer alphabetically, but that, that has nothing to do with the actual data values, right? So, but, but there are cases particularly like time series plots um, and, and some other cases where order matters. And so I'm gonna create just a simple data frame here um, and all I'm doing is using the data frame method um, on, a, on a simple dictionary that has an X and Y column. And X is just a list of 100 numbers and Y is the square though. So it's just, it's just a, gonna define a parabola. And so, you, so the only thing that's different here now is, notice I don't even have to say what, I, what the kind is with my plot method here on this data frame because line plots turn out to be a default when you ha for, two, for, a, for a two axis plot in, in pandas. So, and there you have it. I mean, it's not, it's not very beautiful, but I just wanted to show you guys the method for doing line plots. We're not gonna do much with that today, but it is an important plot type for certain types of data, so do be aware of it. So bar plots are a little tricky if you're used to other plotting packages um, because there is a bar plot method, and you can see that in this second set of code, counts.plot.bar, but, but it needs to be based on counts, not on you can't just give it the column of, from your original data frame. It, there, there is no, that method, that bar plot method literally just plots counts. So what we gotta do is create counts 
and we're going to do it. We're going to look at the make. Make is like the manufacturer, and we're going to use the value counts method. Okay, everybody with me on that? So we wind up with this series, a, a one, a single column. Panda's data structure is called a series because it, it's not a data frame. It doesn't have, there's not multiple columns. So the index of this series is just the manufacturer. And notice that it nicely orders them. This is just a, the way Pandas works. It nicely orders them from the most frequent car to, or the manufacturer with the most frequent cars to the one manufacturer with the least frequent. And so now that we have counts, I'm going to apply the counts.plot.bar method to, but to that counts series, not to my original data frame, okay? It's a little tricky. And notice I'm using yet a different figure size here, but all the rest of this should be familiar by now. And, well, other than the fact I picked two, let me make my figure size smaller so you guys can see it actually. Okay, so now we've got a nice ordered, and, and something in terms of perception, your perception, your colleagues' perception, bosses and customers or whoever you're gonna to present to, it's always very nice with a bar plot um, to order it. Either this is descending order or it could be ascending order, but if you order it, People don't have to look and go, okay, I see Toyota is the most common, but is it Nissan or Honda? And is Honda more common than Mitsubishi? You know, you can hardly tell, right? I mean, they're only different. Actually, I think they're, those three all have exactly the same number of cars. But if they were just in some random order, people would really have to study your plot to understand it. And you yourself would. So, which is one of those things you want to avoid when you're doing good data visualizations. So order, order the, <laughs> the lesson is order, order your counts, either ascending or descending, and, and it may matter, you know, depending on what you're trying to do, right? So a histogram, any questions up to that point then? Are we okay? Okay. So a, a histogram is like, so a bar plot, Notice this is discrete or categorical data. A car is either a Toyota, you know, it has a manufacturer, and it's one of the, it, in this particular data set, it turns out to be one of these names from this list. Um, and, but those are discrete values. A car can't be 1.2 Toyota or something like that, right? But, um, Oh, also notice to somebody else's question, it, pandas plotting does do this nice thing. When you get too many axes labels, notice how it, it knew to change, it, it kind of figured out that, oh, I'm gonna get a lot of, if I put those labels horizontally, which is the normal way to do it, there's gonna be a lot of overprinting. So it turned them vertically so that you can see them better. But you can do that, you can force that too. So, so a histogram, we have a continuous variable like engine size. Engine size in these data are in cubic inches and there's, there's no categorical, you know, a car could have 144 cubic inch engine, it could have 143 or 141 or, you know, whatever. So, or 144.6. You know, it, it is a numeric, you know, it's a, it's a continuous variable. It's not a categorical variable. So therefore we use histograms. So histograms, you simply, around some bins, create counts. Nicely, pandas doesn't, unlike bar plots where they force you to compute the counts yourself, the histogram does it all automatically. Now one trick is, if you just did auto prices dot plot dot hist, it would try to make a histogram with all the numeric um, variables plotted one on top in, in some funny way, it, which probably isn't what you want. I mean, maybe sometimes it is. So you need to subset. So I'm subsetting that data frame to just the column I'm interested in right now, engine size. 
And so, so that's why that little extra bit there with the square bracket subset operator on column is, is being used. And all the rest of this is the same, you know, where we set up a figure, we define an axis, we use that axis for the titles and the, and the, um, <coughs> pardon, oops, and once again, you know, I should have gone through, I'm sorry, I should have gone through and made these all reasonable size so you guys can see them. So here's a histogram of engine size, and so in terms of when you look at this, there's a feature of this histogram that really stands out. And what, what is that? Anybody? About the nature of these autos? Anybody? Because you've got really tiny engines down here and some really ginormous engines up here. But what do you see about that distribution? It's very skewed, right. Auto manufacturers, at least in this sample, <laughs> tended to have cars with pretty, with, on the small end of engine size. Um, there was a question? Could you do this with like curb weight and engine size? Like well, if you want to put two factor or two cars? Yeah, that's where you could, you, could, you could play around with having like a, I don't know if this will, I don't know if I can do this in real time, but I think you do something like, you have to insert a list here. Let's see. I'm not sure this. Hmm. I think that'll work. Oop. You need one more bracket on the right. Oh, oh, right. It, yeah. yeah, the wonders. Yeah, but you get, see, this is the problem. You get this funky thing, right, where... <laughs> I was wondering if it would like group them together, almost like a. Like no, a no, it tries to plot them side in the same set of axes. If I was, do, you know, so this is, so if you want to look at engine size versus curb weight, for example, that's probably a better better option to use a scatter plot. This is a case like what I was talking about right at the beginning, that you don't. You know, you need to think about what are you trying to view, what of you know which. When you reach into your toolboxes of plot types, which plot type actually is going to display what, what you're hoping for? And, um, you, you know, you could do things, you could, you could have two axes side by side or one above another. You know, you could show the two histograms if that somehow meant something to you in your analysis. Um, but if I was going to compare those, I would I would want to look at a scatter plot. That would be my first thought. All right. So let's talk about box plots. How many people know what a, what I'm even talking about? Yeah, okay. Close to half the room. Good. So let me just make some. So. So the idea of a box plot, the original idea is, I think Tukey published this originally in like 1960 or something. So it's been around a long time. And the idea was if you have a bunch of, I, I think this may actually go to the question we just had of like comparing distributions of two different, you know, for different variables. So, so what if you have something like engine size that we were just looking at and then you have some categorical variable like fuel type. In this case, I think these cars either have gasoline or diesel engines. So there's only two fuel types. And, and so, so what we can do is we do, we select those two columns, engine size and fuel type, and we use the box plot method, and we say by equals fuel type. So that's like a group by. So we're going to group cars by fuel type, and we're going to display this box plot, which I'll explain in a minute. Oh. And once again, I got ridiculously large. I don't know what. You know what it is? Probably that the projection is lower resolution. Oops, I didn't. I meant to do it the other way. Eight by six. Sorry. Okay, 
So, so what you can see is on the, the left-hand plot here, we've got the diesel engines. The right-hand plot, we got the gas engines. And then we have engine size. So, so how do you compare these things? So the red lines are the median value. So you can see the median value. The median diesel engine is a bit bigger than the median gasoline engine. Then one quartile of the data above the median and one quartile of the data, by quartile I mean one fourth of the values um, below, the, below the median, that's what defines the box. And you can see the boxes almost overlap here. Then we go out another, well either till we run out of values or up to one and a half quartiles. And that's called the whisker. And then if we have outliers beyond that, we put these plus signs. So we can learn a little bit from a plot like this. It's, it's not totally definitive, but um, it looks like maybe sort of the bulk of diesel cars have maybe slightly bigger engines. You can see that box is a little higher than this box. Probably not that significant given the overlap. But you can also see the gasoline cars have a much wider range of engines from you know, barely 50 cu cubic inches, way up to some pretty ginormous engine that's like 300 and, I don't know, whatever that would be, 25 cubic inches or something, much bigger than any diesel car. Because you see those plus signs for the outliers. And so that's a way to compare, and you could have multiple. We'll look at some examples where we have more categories, and you can quickly c compare. So, so now we're gonna talk about Seaborn. And Seaborn works a little bit different from pandas plotting. By the way, is everybody with me up to this, this point now? Okay, good. All right, so assuming he got Seaborn successfully installed, which generally doesn't seem to be a problem, um, and I'm not quite sure why all anaconda distributions don't include it. Was there a question or? No, okay. Um, so, the, the simplest recipe that I've laid out here for making a Seaborn plot is to import the package, which you always have to do, set a style for the plot grid, and that's kind of like setting up the axes for the other plots we've seen, um, although it's, it's not quite the same, and you'll see why that is, I think, in a while. And then you, you define a, the, the plot type and, and you have to say which columns you want that to apply to. So in this case, so we import, import Seaborn as SNS, and so then I have this method on SNS called set style, and I'm gonna pick a style called white grid. That's just like the most generic style. It's just a white background with a, with a gridded, um, gr you know, gridded axes. So pretty, pretty, pretty simple, pretty generic. So then I'm going to use a method called KD plot for kernel density and plot. And I'm just going to do that on engine size, just on one column. Now again, if you had several, you know, you could, if you had columns for engine size for, you know, diesel and gas or something, you could do different things here. But let's just do this real simple thing. Oh, and notice that sometimes you get this weird deprecation warning. Um, so, so this looks a lot, remember the histogram we had of engine size? So imagine that we took a, what's called a kernel um, estimator, which is like a Gaussian shaped curve, weighted curve, and we ran that over there and we found sort of a smooth fit over that histogram. Instead of binning, we tried to get a smooth fit over the density of curves. And there's one other thing they do. It's a density, it's a probability density, so the integral over this whole curve has to add up to one, which is you know one of the axioms of probability, right? So, but you can see in this case, I don't think we're learning a whole lot more. We're seeing that, as we discovered before, manufacturers have a tendency to build cars with, much, with smaller engines. It's only a few sort of outlier cars 
that have these really large engines. Okay? Now notice also what went away here. Because I didn't specify. I did this in a real simple way. What's, what's missing? Yeah, my axis labels and my, my title and all that. Because I didn't do anything about it. So let's, okay, so you can probably guess <laughs> that's what we're going to do next. So again, we can define a, define a set of axes, define a figure, define a set of axes, and when we say that we're going to do this KD plot method, we say AX equals X, and then we can, just as we did with like the pandas plots, and you can do this with matplotlib plots. So that's why it's important to kind of understand all this stuff is coming up from matplotlib. This whole business of the set underbar title, set underbar x label, etc., is all just matplotlib um, stuff that can be superimposed on another, any other, some of these other plots, and so. Now I've kind of decorated this plot with proper axis labels and a title. Okay? So, so before we get off kernel density estimation plots, I'm just going to point out that there's another thing you can do, which I think is actually sometimes really cool. And this is partly Someone pointed out that we had a lot of overplotting when we looked at engine size versus price, and this is partly a way to get around that. Oh yes, what was the question? Didn't you have some error message That's a deprecation warning. I, yeah, some versions you get that. It, it, I, I actually ran it down once, and they said, "Oh, it's a bug." So <laughs> after reading like pages and pages of. <laughs> of discussion. So that's why I made a note earlier on to just ignore that um, if you get it. I, I don't know, is anybody else besides me getting it? Nope. Oh, a few people. Okay. So it depends what version of Anaconda you've got, I guess, um, or which version of Seaborn you got. I'm not sure where it's, I think it's actually coming from Matplotlib, not even from Seaborn. But feel free to ignore it. And that's why it's a warning. It's not an error message, it's a warning. Um, and it also turns out to be an incorrect warning because it's not actually a problem. So, okay, so 2D plots, 2D, so it's the same KDE plot, but now I just give it a list. See, so I have square bracket, then square bracket, you know, then a list with another square bracket. So I just have a list of, so I've got two columns, engine size and price. Oh, and I'm also going to, someone asked about colors. So the C map is like a, like a color palette I'm gonna pick from. And, and you'll see why that is. And, and, and if you look in the, in the Seaborn documentation or the tutorials, somewhere down here, there's a whole, um, there, you know, yeah, color palettes. There's a whole yeah, a lot of stuff about color palettes. They they do a really nice job of color palettes with Seaborn. Um, there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do. They've also thought about like that a lot of a, a big percentage of the of people are red green colorblind, so they try to steer away from red green palettes and stuff like that. So it's whoever did this really knew what they were doing. Yes. Uh, in the last tutorial, when they were doing the plotting, it was a, a method of the data frame itself. What's the difference between doing it this way versus the other way? Well, okay, so we're not using pan. This is now Seaborn, so it's a completely different thing. But you could also do, so way back to the pandas plotting. Let's see, what was our last? Like this one, I think I could do count counts.plot, and then, let's see, well, we can try it. It should be, let's see, I think, like, kind equals, and then I think bar has to be in quotes, and then I need a comma. All right. Oh, and get rid of that. I think that'll come up with the same plot. Yeah, see. It, it, the answer is it doesn't matter. 
It's a style thing. I, you can do it, you can explicit, some people prefer to, so his question was, in, um, when Quentin did his pandas tutorial, he was using a style like this, counts.plot, and then he would say kind equals, whereas I'm doing counts.plot.plot dot plot method, like this. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Do you like do you like arguments to your methods or the list of methods <laughs> in your code? I, I, they, as far as I can tell, they're interchangeable. I, I've never noticed a difference. So, but it's a good observation of the detail. Okay, so let's get back to yeah. Here we are. So 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 I was explaining. So I've got this list of two columns here. That's so I'm subsetting my data for my auto prices data frame to just those two columns. And I've set this um, color palette. So let's let that go. And there you go. There's, there's other things, nah, I'm sorry. You know, I'm a, I tested this on my standalone display, which obviously has more resolution than the projector, so. All right. So now you can see it. Um, so you can see that there is in fact, you know, this is like a contour map, like a topo map or something. And you can see what that color palette is doing. It starts out the lowest rungs are close to black and the lightest rungs, they're such a dark blue, they almost look black. Um, and then the top rung is this really light, light blue up here, right? And, and so, when we talked about overplotting and that there were a lot of data points, so let's go back to the scatter plot and you'll see what I mean. Go way back, sorry. So see in some of these areas here, there's just so many dots you can't really tell how many are on top, one on top of each other, and we call that overplotting. And this is only, you know, we only have, as we saw, 195 cars in this sample. But imagine you were doing this on customers for an e-commerce site where you might have millions or something. This overplotting becomes an overwhelming issue. And so you need other methods um, to deal with it. So one of them is this, kernel this 2D kernel density estimation plot, like this. Another, which I don't think we go into, is, is called a hex bin plot. Hex bin plots, well, I have a, if you look at my GitHub, you'll see, um, actually, I think I just have a link to it, but some work Ryan Heffen and I did where we were plotting, um, making scatter plots of every home sale in the United States for the last 20 years or something like that. It was a fairly big data set, not giant, you know, not big data, big, but big. And we used these hex bin plots and it gave a similar effect. Um, whereas if we had done scatter plots, we just would have had blobs. There would have been so many dots one on top of the other, it just would have been an, un, you know, an un, uninterpretable blob. So when you're making plots, if you, if you wind up with blobs, think about other methods like this 2D kernel density estimation or hex bin plots. Um, so is it clear to everybody why this is giving us what it's giving us? And what do you conclude from looking at something like this? Oops, oh, was there a question? Yeah, your legend is on the previous plot, that was just simply a line. You had a legend. You mean this plot? Yeah, engine size. Oh, yeah, right, because we're doing engine size here, it gives a legend. But in this case, I've given it two. I've given it two um, columns that we're sort of contouring over. So it's price on the vertical, engine size on the horizontal. You don't really need a legend. What if I wanted to make it more complicated and have another? Oh, a 3D plot. Um, yeah, you, you can do that in Matplotlib. Um, I don't think there's any 3D plotting in Seaborn. In fact, I'm pretty sure there isn't. So, so the answer is <laughs> you can do it with enough work with matplotlib primitives. Um, in fact, I think in those, 
the resources I gave you, um, if you click through that and look at some of those tutorials, there's actually some examples of that. But it's a lot of code. So be warned if you really need to do it, do it. Um, I'll also make the comment, one of the, I'm not keen on 3D plots um, because they, they're so dependent. This is something Cleveland looked at and some other people. I think, I th I think, um, I think Tufti even talks about this, that it depends on, if you have a 3D surface, imagine you have to have an eye point, a perspective and how people will view how peaky and rough your surface is depends on you know, how it's oriented. And so it can be very tricky. Um, in fact, you know, pi, you'll notice I don't, I mean there's a number of types of plots I don't use. I don't use 3D plots generally. I don't use pie, pie charts um, because um, um, I, think, I think it was Tukey said they're, they're an excellent tool for obfuscating almost any, any point you're trying to make. <laughs> um, even though if you look at like infographics and news sites and stuff, they're very popular. But, but if you think about it, I, I have some examples for another class I teach, which is longer, and we look at some um, having to do with elections in various countries where there's a lot of political parties. I mean, it, it looks like some sort of psychedelic pattern. You cannot tell <laughs> who, which party has what percentage of the vote in the parliament or something like that, because it's just, it's just useless. So, so anyway, what, but, but what do you guys, when you look at this plot, it's, it's, it's actually telling us something pretty interesting. I mean, assuming you're that interested in the price of cars, but, um, what, what, what is it? Anybody? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say they're the same. So I don't think that's quite true. Because the units are quite different for one thing. Um, but they do, they do tend to be ellipt. I mean, there is a high covariance, right? They get down to be elliptical. Um, you know, so anything with ellipses sort of indicates, you know, with the elongated ellipse on these contours. But there was just something even more obvious than that. Yeah, so 100, well, I think it's cubic inches, but yeah, <laughs> there are lots of cheap cars with 100 cubic inch, <laughs> roughly engines on the market in 1985, so because there's a clear peak, and there's only one peak in this. Is there, oh, there's a, I think there's a question way in the back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so you'll get, yeah, if it's, so the question is if we did this with, City MPG. You get two, you get, you actually get a little more complicated. So first off, there's obviously some outlier cars that, that, oh, well, this is city miles per gallon. I didn't change the label, apologies. Anyway, so there's some pretty low fuel efficiency expensive cars. There seems to be a cluster of those. Those, I, I actually, I can, t I'll spill the beans. Those are luxury cars, <laughs> so they're not built for fuel efficiency um, up in that corner. And then you see, yeah, there's two modes of this where manufacturers either want these really cheap high fuel efficiency cars or kind of mid, I imagine they're sort of mid-sized cars or something like that. Um, so, yeah, so you can, you know, it, this is a good point though. Um, that, you know, you want to look at lots, I, I mentioned this when we started, you always want to look at lots of views of your data. And this is a, you know, there's only 20, 20 columns or something that we're working with in this data set. But you can see even with just 20 columns, there's a fair amount of complexity here that if you were trying to really understand this and maybe you were trying to build a machine learning model to predict the price of cars based on certain attributes or something like that, maybe for your competitors if you work for a car company or something, um, you know, you, you would really have to work quite a bit to 
fully understand this and be able to create an, a deep understanding of what, what these data are telling you. So another interesting pl plot is the violin plot. So it's very similar to the box. So it kind of combines the best of box plot and density plots. And um, so kind of like the box plot, we have an X, which is a categorical variable, and, the, and it should always be a categorical variable, fuel type. And then we have a Y, which is a um, continuous variable. So we'll just use engine size, but we could use price. We could do, you know, you could use lots of different columns. And like I say, in practice, if we were really doing this exploration as a real project, we'd be doing probably hundreds or thousands of plots till we figured it out. But let's just do this one. Okay. And so you can see it looks like you can imagine that kernel density estimation plot we looked at for engine size before, where we just looked at all cars. So you can imagine, so it's, it's got the same thing on the left and on the right. It's just symmetric. So you can look at either side. And it just shows you there is a distinct peak in the gasoline cars. And kind of the diesel cars, their engine size is sort of more uniformly distributed, right? And you can actually see they've done a little box plotty kind of thing in here. The dot, the white dot, is is the median, and you can see the upper, the upper inner, the upper inner quartile, the lower inner quartile, you know, et cetera. And you can also see, as we saw before with the box plots, there's a lot of outliers in gasoline cars. There's apparently a lot of gasoline cars with really big engines. Okay, so everything we've done up till now, everybody okay up till now? Okay. Um, so, so let's, so we're gonna now switch gears. We're about halfway through our time or a little more. And we're gonna start looking at ways to extend beyond two dimensions. So everything we've done has been one or two dimension. One dimensional plots like histograms and the, the 1D kernel density estimation, 2D plots like the scatter plots and the, the contour plots and things like that. So let's start looking at aesthetics. And so the first is, so we're gonna look at color, transparency, size, marker shape, and some plot specific aesthetics. And, um, so color, color is a very tricky aesthetic. It seems very simple, like, oh, I can just color, but, but there's a lot of problems. I already mentioned the issue that a lot of people are red, green, especially men for some reason, are red, green color blind. So when you think of, of what palette you're gonna use for colors, consider those kinds of things. Seaborn actually does a pretty good job of suggest the palettes that are kind of the standard palettes, try to avoid ones that are hard for colorblind people. Um, but there's a method in Seaborn called, and, and also don't pick too many colors. I've seen plots, um, I just saw one the other day where I was, we were working on and, and someone had done like 20 colors and you couldn't tell the difference between all these shades of red and all these shades of green and you know, we were going back and forth and back and forth between the legend and the, and the dots and it, you know, it was very, it, it depended on every, everybody saw something different, you know, so, so don't go crazy with any, actually it's true of any of these aesthetics. You can show a certain number of other dimensions, but you can't show huge numbers of values. So this LM plot, it just means linear model plot, but I'm actually gonna set reg fit to false, because I don't wanna, I, you get regression lines is what happens on the plot, which can be really useful, but in this case, I don't wanna confound what we're really looking at, which is we're gonna set the hue as fuel type, and I'm gonna use this set to palette, okay? So, right away, so you can see what happened here. Fuel type, so gas or diesel, and you can see the, the red dots are the diesel and the kind of greenish dots. So <laughs> I guess they did pick red green in this case, but, um, or at least I did. Um, the blue, I guess they're more like blue green, but anyway. So, 
so you can see something now interesting about this price versus miles per gallon, um, which, which is what? What does that tell you about gasoline versus di diesel cars? Anybody? Yeah, you get more mileage for, your, for the amount of money you spend on your car if you buy a diesel car, which is, I mean, everybody probably knows that, but this demo, you know, you can see that in almost every case, the diesel cars are to the right of the gasoline cars at almost every price level. And remember before we saw this clump of kind of very high cost, low efficiency cars, those were these luxury cars. Um, if you don't believe me, you can <laughs> you can make a plot and just do like you know Mercedes and Porsche and Jaguar and a few makes in 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 a select, and you'll see that's true. So, um, or you so it gets a little complicated. I don't want to spend a we just don't have the time to go through this, but I wanted you guys to see you can get a lot more control and you can use the pandas plotting methods. In this case, I'm gonna create, but I just wanna give you the general recipe. So what I did is, again, I define a figure. Let me make it smaller so you guys, so it doesn't spill out again. Um, I set some axes, and I, cr I basically subset my data frame for gas, so I've created two data frames here for gas and diesel, and if I had four categories, I'd have to do four. Um, data frames, and then I apply, and, and I also make sure that there's something in that data frame. So the shape, the first shape, shape is the, the number of rows and the number of columns in the data frame. So shape zero is the number of rows. So if the number of rows is greater than zero, I'll go ahead and plot it, because I don't want to error out if I have to in this function if I happen to have it. But that's, a, that's kind of a technical detail. So I'm gonna plot both of these. And um, you could also do this as a list. I mean, it's, it's, there's probably more elegant ways to do this, but I thought this was more straight. And so I've got kind equals scatter, I guess to someone's question that was before why. So in this case, I'm not doing the, the plot method as a dot, I'm doing it as a kind. And I'm gonna give those colors dark blue and those red. And everything else is, oh, and then I'm, I'm doing some, I'm creating some legends here. So I just do that. And I have essentially the same plot you just saw using Seaborn, a lot more code. But I just wanted to show you guys for future, if you, you can get a lot more control this way at the expense of a lot more code. So let's look at transparency. So we looked at overplotting in one method, which was the 2D scatter plots. But so now, now we get to something where you have to do what the recipe I just showed you, because I can set something called alpha. And by the way, alpha is the same in Seaborn, it's the same in um, um, Matplotlib, it's the same in pandas. So alpha is a transparency value. So alpha of zero is completely transparent. You wouldn't see the points at all. Alpha of one is what we've been working with. It's perfectly opaque. You can't see through it at all. So we're gonna try point three. And you see these single points up here look pretty, pretty fuzzy now. And you can start to get some better idea of down here where there's overplotting, where there's really a lot of points or maybe just one or two on top of each other, okay? So transparency is pretty useful. So, um, so here's a little um, code exercise for you. Yeah, we have time for that. So um, copy, just go ahead and do copy and paste. Um, and do this, kind of do the same thing for engine size and curb weight. So this is like price and, and city miles per gallon, but go ahead and create a similar plot for engine size and curb weight. You can, you can try the pandas or you can, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna try it with Seaborn. See if I can get it to work. Because 
So it would be. Oh, for those of you new to um, notebooks, if you need a new, just go insert cell below and you get a, a cell for your code. What did I say? Engine size. That's the problem. Doesn't know how to do an alpha. Uh, okay, so I see that's why. Okay, so Seaborn doesn't know about alpha. There's a way to do it. Didn't like it. You mean the alpha? Oh, let's try. So that's the argument? Oh, yeah, okay, I'm remembering this now. Yeah. But it's, I'm trying to remember, is it? Is it an argument to LM plot or something else you apply? Or do you have to do another call on SNS with a different method? I think it's an argument you can pass to LM plot like you talked about. Yeah. I think I'll just. Yeah, it seems like something you ought to be able to do, but. <laughs> So I kind of did it the, the the hard way, although it sounds like there's a better way to do it with with Seaborn. Um, but you get the basic idea um, that it's just a different view of the data, engine size and curb weight. Not too surprisingly, pretty highly correlate it, and generally, um, diesel engines. If you turn, actually you could flip the axis around, you'd see that 
cars tend to have somewhat smaller engine size per weight if they're diesels. Okay, so the last thing we've got here is marker size. And marker size is, um, is, um, is again one of these tricky things that you don't want to get too carried away, but you can use it on a continuous variable. And so this is the same code we've been working with. And I'm just going to, and what I've done is S is for the size attribute, you see? And it's, and I did 0.5 just to get a scaling of auto prices of engine size. So now we're gonna, so, well let me make this plot and then you'll see what's, what's interesting about it. So you see the size of the dots now varies with the engine size. You see we've got gas and diesel cars, we've got price and cities miles to gallon. So how many dimensions, so I advertised that we were going to um, look at multiple dimensions using, um, using these um, aesthetics. So how many dimensions are we actually plotting here now from our multi-dimensional data set? I think somebody's saying four. Yeah, that's right, so we've got type of engine fuel, we've got engine size, we've got price, we've got cities, miles to the gallon. But can you guys see that there's kind of a, a little bit of a problem? It's a little hard to say. I mean, these dots aren't that different in size, like from these, these luxury cars with the really big engines, and clearly you can see for some of these economy cars, they're smaller, but it's not that distinct, right? So one trick is to, to go with engine size squ um, squ squared. So I've got auto price, and so I've just multiply the two columns together here. You could create a new column in the data frame too. And you can see that, don't you think that makes, well let me, let me rescale that for you. So I think, I mean that, to me, to my eye, and probably to yours, doesn't that look a lot different that you can see these cars with these really big engines over here and a few down here, and really small engines in some of these other areas. So, so keep that in mind. So the difference is, this is now, engine size is now proportional to the area of the, of the shape. And you can change shapes too, we'll talk about that in a sec and um, as opposed to the linear dimension of the shape. So this is work people like Cleveland and others have done that the human eye is more sensitive to the area of the shape you're looking at than the linear dimension. And so finally, we are gonna use marker shape. So, so I know it's getting kind of confused. So we've got size, we've got color, We've got alpha, and then we're gonna do marker equals mk. So I've got this list of zeros and pluses, and a list of colors. And you can see turbo cars are dots, or, and, and standard, or, and stand, I'm sorry, yeah, and standard cars are crosses. So if it's a turbo, it's a circle, if it's a standard car. So, eh, once again, so I did not think to, I didn't think about how, how different the resolution would be on the screen. So, there you go. So how many dimensions are we now projecting onto this um, two-dimensional surface? Anybody? <laughs> Just lost. <laughs> five, yeah, five is right. Because we've got whether it's standard or turbo, we've got whether it's gas or diesel, and we've got the engine size, we've got the price, and we've got the fuel efficiency. So five dimensions on a two dimensional. So we're using three different plot aesthetics here, um, which at least the way I did it here is a little bit, quite a bit of code 
Um, but that's not so important. I'm going to skip a little bit of this. That doesn't using those little plus shapes kind of make them not as weighty as the big Yeah, it could be I should have used triangles or something. Yeah, the, so his question is the plus shapes maybe don't look as weighty as the equivalent dots. Yeah, maybe to some people's eyes. So you could use triangles or, or squares or something like that. There's, there's ways to do yeah, that, that might have been a better choice, perhaps. Um, something that you see an area. Um, so, let me just go here and do... So plot-specific aesthetics are lots of things. Um, like here, I'm just going to do this real quick with histograms. Um, so all I've done is change the number of bins. So we're back to pandas plotting here. So in one case, I just took the default. In one case, I said bins equals 40. So I think the default is 10. And you can see they're pretty chunky bins, right? But it looks, but the, but the histogram looks kind of smooth and easy to interpret. What's the problem with 40? I mean, you see more detail, but, but does that really tell you more? What do, what do you think the problem is there? It's just looking at noise. It's just, you know, it's just, it doesn't mean that much that it's just jumping from one little bin to the next by so much. So obviously I've picked too many bins. So when you're creating things like histograms, density, the density plot, you can set a, what's called the kernel width. Um, Think about and try different things to find something that suits your data. Now, if we had you know, 10,000 values instead of 195, maybe even smaller bin widths would start to make sense for a histogram. But we only have 195 data points, so we can't push, the, push it too much. So a cool thing you can do, we already looked at color with Seaborn with some of those other plots, but here I'm doing hue as aspiration. I'm doing this for that violin plot. So it's the same violin plot we looked at before with fuel type. So you've got, you know, so again, we just set, set our grid, you know, we, we apply the violin plot method, um, fuel type, price, aspiration. So, so the new thing is this, aspiration. And, oh, and split equals true. So you'll see what that, does in a minute. So what it means is now we get, remember before we had just the two sides of the violin plot were just mirror images of each other. They, they weren't different at all. But now we can see whether they're standard or turbo on either side and it shows it in a nice different color. So this gives us a way, so we've now got how many dimensions on this plot? Three? Yeah, three. So we've got whether it's gas or diesel, we've got whether it's standard or turbo, and we've got the price. And you can do the same thing for engine size, et cetera. Or with box plots, let's do something a little different. So body style, there's a lot more body styles. Yeah? <coughs> Sorry, I can't. So in the violin plot up there? Uh, in this plot? Yeah, so there's a median and... Uh, and. Oh, the median is again for the whole group. It's not, uh, it's, it's not giving you like two medians and two. You have to look at the density plots on the left and the right to get the differences. Yeah, so, so you could create other subsets or other variables to... to so I, we don't need to go through this, but you can see if you, by, because there's five body styles, you can see you get quite different box plots for gas and diesel depending on whether it's like a, I think one of these is a, um, a convertible, et cetera. So I just wanted to show you that. Okay, so yeah, okay, so we've got half an hour. So I think we've got enough time to do a little exercise here. So. And um, so 
So we just looked at um, that violin plot. So try it with drive wheels. So just make the violin plot a price. Um, so it's price by aspiration, but make the hue drive wheels, and you'll see it'll be different. And there's three types of drive wheels. I just wanted to sh you to see that. So it's pretty quick to do that. Just do some cut and paste. I think that's right. Nope. What's the variable name? Uh, I gotta go all the way back up. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, it's not the hue. Oh, right, I should have kept the hue the same. It's the, it's, this should be drive wheels on the X. So you can do it. That's what you get. And this one then should be fuel type. Okay. Right, okay. Yeah, that's what I wanted to show. <laughs> so, yeah, and the point is, like, as the error message, as the person pointed out, the error message said, yeah, you can only have two, two, a, a two-level categorical variable to do this color split. Um, so obviously I could use gas and diesel or, I, or fuel type or I could use aspiration, but there's an interesting thing. With four-wheel drive vehicles, what do you see? Yeah, there's no, there's no diesel four-wheel drive vehicles in these data. So, but you know, and, and you can see that every one of these, for front-wheel drive vehicles, you can see that they tend to be the cheap cars, regardless of whether they're gas or diesel. They, they're all clumped down there at the cheap end. Um, Rear wheel drive cars have this big range and, and four wheel drive cars for some reason are down there. So, okay, so I promised we're gonna look at multiple axes types. And um, so let's spend the rest of our time on that. So this, so everything we've done is just had one X axis, one Y axis up till now. So now we're gonna look at multi-axis plots and there's a couple ways to, to skin that cat. And this is a scatter plot matrix. It's called a joint plot in Seaborn. And we're gonna do engine size by price. And so a joint plot is just a scatter plot, as you see. And then it gives you the histogram of what, what we would call the marginal densities along that edge. So that's why it's called a a split plot. Well, you see, we we've added these extra ex axes, which are the the counts or the densities on the edges. So that's just a simple example of now a plot that, it, that you know tells us something new, um, but is quite you know. But you can't create a plot like that with just one pair of axes, right? So another more complicated plot is a pairwise scatter plot. And Seaborn has this thing called pair plot. And these things, I, you've probably seen them before. They've been around for a long time, at least 30 years. Um, and we're gonna do, I'm gonna define the numeric columns to be these. This, you can do categorical columns, but it, I, I'm just gonna stick with numeric columns. We're gonna use fuel type as hue and we're going to use that same palette. And on the diagonal, I'm gonna put kernel density plots. And I've set a, um, and we're gonna do KDE plots, those 2D kernel density estimation plots on the upper diagonal. So you'll see this, this might take a little while to compute here.
a little warning message, which I'm choosing to ignore for now. Okay, so there's a lot going on here, as you can see. So here we've got, so the way you read this is you've got length, curb weight, engine size, horsepower, city miles per gallon price. Then you've got exactly the same variable names on this axis. So, so you've got price by length down in this corner here. You've got price by curb weight, but if you want to look at curb weight by price, you, let's see, curb weight. So, so you can see the kernel density plot of, let's see, curb weight by price will be this one here. So you can see there's sort of two peaks in that. Um, you can see for gas and diesel cars, because that's what we used as, a, as the hue, you can see the histogram or the kernel density plots for each of those. Um, so, so now, so now, how many how many dimensions do we have on our plot? Count them up. <laughs> nine, because we got eight eight numeric columns plus fuel type as a categorical. So we got nine. All right, so someone asked this question about multiple um, plot axes. And so the way you, we, we kind of snuck into this once before, but so I can, so here I've got my figure and my axis. So it's typical Python stuff, right, with the comma, because I have two, uh, this function is going to return, or this method is going to return two things, a figure and an axis, and I do plot dot subplots two by two. So that means I'm doing a two by two array of subplots, and this is like way too big a figure size, I'll never see it. I'm going to do eight by eight, and then um, so I'm just going to say, so, so I've got an x, so this is a little function, so I can say what my x column, my y column are, and we're just going to, um, um, do histograms. So you can see I subset with some kind of gnarly notation here, and then plot.hist. So I'm actually using matplotlib's plot method, histogram method here. So I've gone all the way down to the base matplotlib. Um, for no good, I mean, I could have used, I could have created data frames here and, and used pandas or something like that or Seaborn. But it was just easier, well, at least in my view, it was easier to just create two lists called X calls and Y calls and, um, iterate over over them or enumerate over them. But the important thing is then, you see I do in fact have a, t well, <laughs> I've got all sorts of over plotting here. So I'd have to work on this more, right, to get these separated a little bit and all this. But I think you get the idea that the key thing that I've done here is I've defined a figure and a set of axes that's a two by two array of axes. You guys all see that? That's like the, the important thing to notice here. And, and you can see I'm having problems. I've got some over printing and, and I can't really read my axis and my axis labels are a little funny. And I'd have to go back, if I wanted to compare these histograms, I'd have to go back and create code to make sure that the, the, um, the x-axis lengths were exactly the same on each of these. But fortunately, there's an easier way to do this, which is called facet plotting. And so th this, if you run into this, it can be called conditioned plotting, which I think is what Cleveland originally called it. It can be called the method of small multiples, which is what Tufti originally called it. It can be called facet, nowadays most people call it facet plotting. It's sometimes called grouped plotting. So it's, it's, but think about it as a group by operation 
where you divide your data and then plot it on multiple axes, okay? And the basic idea is, remember we just created a standard grid before um, with Seaborn, but now we're gonna use this facet grid method. And I'm gonna say columns equals drive wheels. So I'm gonna do a group by drive wheels. And so whatever I plot here, and I use this map method, I'm gonna use a reg plot of engine size and price, and I'm not gonna show that regression line. So is that clear what, what's going on there? That we're creating a grid which only has columns. So it's a one row by however many columns of drive wheels, which will be three. Um, and, then a, and then I'm plotting engine size and price, okay? So, so there you have it. And you notice some interesting things. First off, the axes, facet grid methods make the axes exactly all the same length. So I can compare one plot to the other to the other. So that's really nice. It also figures out that I don't really need another set of axes labels here and here. I can just use those. And so, so it just saves me a lot of time. Um, and it does the group by, you know, the group by, I don't have to, I had that gnarly stuff in the code here where I was effectively doing, I could, you know, a, a grouping <laughs> or a subsetting. Um, so, and you can do, like, let's try one with um, drive wheels by body style. So we got, now we're doing columns and rows. Okay, so our grid now is gonna have two dimensions. This is a one-dimensional grid. This next set of code, it's the same engine size by price, but we're gonna do it, we're gonna su create subplots by drive wheels and body style. All right? And you can see there's three types of drive wheels and there's actually five types of body style. So it's a lot of different plots. Um, there's a couple things you can see, like, like there's no four-wheel drive hard tops. You see there's, there's no dots there, right? And there's only one, there's only one, um, and, and you see how I'm reading these. It's body style equals hard top, drive wheels equals front wheel drive. There's only one. So most hard tops, whatever a hard, I'm not even sure what a hard top is, but whatever they are, they're mostly rear wheel drive cars. And you see, so start to see, you know, some price relationships for these different subsets. So this is a very limited data set, as I keep saying, it's only 195 points. But if you had thousands of points and you wanted to explore high dimensional projections of them, this gives you a really powerful way to do it, this, this facet gridding method. And you can add aesthetics. So like, let's do hue of fuel type. So this is, Basically, I'm just making the same plot you just saw with fuel type. And you don't see, so again, you don't see many, I think the diesel cars are the red dots, so you don't see any, like there are no convertibles with diesel engines, so you don't see any red dots. In fact, there's no four-wheel drive convertibles, so, so there's no dots there at all. And then, but here you start to see sedans with front wheel drive, and they're kind of tightly clustered compared to say sedans with rear wheel drive, which have a wide range of prices and, um, and engine sizes. So, so it's not the best example of using um, this kind of scatter plot, but so one last, exercise if you guys want to hang on for a bit. Um, we actually have time, at least by the schedule. Um, so go ahead and do this, but change one of the axes to city miles per gallon instead of engine size. Because remember, we started with that. So you can pretty much cut and paste and do a few changes here.
but we'll keep all the other the faceting variables and the color, the hue as fuel type, et cetera. So it's really a pretty minimal change. So did everybody get it? I mean, it's just a very simple change here. We just had to change change this to city miles per gallon. And you can see, yeah, so do you see some interesting stuff? Like again, sedans with rear wheel drives have a big range of price and a big range of fuel efficiency, but there are no highly fuel efficient sedans, right? They're, they just sort of end there, kind of in the mid-range. Rear front wheel drive sedans have better mileage. And you keep going down here. Let's see, where are the hatchbacks? Oh yeah, hatchbacks. So you can see the, all the really, really fuel efficient cars are hatchbacks. So even though we don't have an ideal data set to use this kind of gridding method here, um, you, yeah, I hope you guys can see that what the value is in terms of s dividing data into small pieces, small chunks, and being able to compare it on exactly the same axes side by side by side. There's also ways, if you wanted to free one axis and not the other, you can set that. There's all kinds of specialized things you can do with this. Um, and you have to think about as you're visualizing a data set um, what to do. So in summary, I hope I've given you a bunch of tools, <laughs> a bag of tools, um, and, and also pointed out some places you can go for the tutorials and what to learn more things. And um, given you, you know, so you, you know how to do this with Python. And also looked at kind of the process of how you explore data and why you explore data and stuff you can learn um, from exploring data when you have complex relationships and you really want to understand it before you, you know, waste a lot of time doing some complicated analysis where you don't really understand what, you know, what the simple relationships might be between your variables. So that's, so um, are there any questions or anybody? Oh, got a couple back there. Yep. Is there a way to make these graphs interactive? So instead of getting, you know, 12 different graphs, we could just have it drop down and say, I only want to look at the so the question is, can you make these graphs interactive? Um, not with the packages we've been looking at. Um, you can do some animation, um, like Matplotlib has an animation um, system that's actually kind of cool. Um, so you could like step through a bunch of categorical variables or something. So it, I just didn't have time to go into that. Um, if you want truly interactive Python graphics, I suggest you look at um, the Bokeh package. Um, which is a whole, we could do <laughs> another two hours just on that. It's its, its own world. Um, but, it, but it's, and it's, it's, the other nice thing about it is it's, it's, it's directly usable in websites. So, so it actually has a couple of really cool things about it. But it, like I said, it's a whole other thing. Uh, oh yeah, there's lots of stuff on Bouquet. I think there might even be a Bouquet book or two. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Someone's there's a talk on Friday. Yes, for sure. But not a tutorial in this conference. Although it would be nice. <laughs> there was a, way in the back. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good suggestion too, the iPy widgets. If you want to do simple, simple interactive stuff, those work pretty, those are pretty nice too. For, and they're specifically for Jupiter. So if you're doing it in Jupiter, then, then, then you, that might be what you need. There was a question there, yeah. Hi, um, 
so I'm relatively new to this visualization with Python. Um, and let's say I have an idea for a plot I want to make. How do I decide where to look for how to learn how to do that? Matplotlib, Seaborn, Pandas. How do I decide? <laughs> yeah, it's like, all, how do I know? Which so the one question to look is: at? Given all these different packages, and we just breeze through like the surface of three of them, how do you decide? Um, I, you know, I don't think. I don't think there's like a best answer to your question. Um, my general rule of thumb is this. I look at Seaborn first usually because it's, it, it is more abstract, you know, they abstract a lot more things as you saw. We didn't write nearly as much code to get fairly complex plots out of it. Um, second might be pandas plotting, if, especially if your data are in pandas data frame. And then I kind of you only use matplotlib if I have to really get into some detail. Um, and I hope that's some helpful guideline, but it's not, you know, there isn't like an absolute best answer. It really depends on what you're trying to do, <laughs> unfortunately. Any other questions or? Oh, please just thank, thanks, Stephen. Right. Thank you all. And <laughs>